Welcome back to the channel. Um, we are proposed a question related to questions that you'll find in the reg review practice exams. I can't ethically take those questions directly, but I was able to design my own. Um, and specifically, we were asked by Frank, um, is it possible for us to do a video regarding economic geology and or structural geology strike dip questions. Um, and then I copied over from Reddit specifically the, the questions that he was asking uh, to go over. So we'll go over those. So basically this uh, first question, uh, number 68, question number 68, it is a three point problem. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go over azimuth versus quadrant notation. Um, the answer in that book is uh, quadrant notation, and then we'll do the actual three-point problem. We'll practice it. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is open up azimuth versus quadrant notation. Okay, so right, let's, I guess, let's enter... Yeah, we'll just put a line. Anyways, okay, so we have zero degrees azimuth at due north in quadrant notation, 27 degrees azimuth, which is just counting from zero on the compass to 27 uh, degrees. Um, in quadrant notation, we're counting from the north in this case, and it's going to be north 27 degrees east. Um, and then 103, so counting out 103 degrees of, uh, on this comp compass, but in quadrant notation, because it's in the uh, south half of the compass, you're going to count from the south uh, line, so this is going to be, let's see, 103, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, uh, about 77 right here, so about 77, so that is south, 77 east. Um, I would recommend that you guys practice these as often as you can. It's important to be able to, to be able to uh, convert from each one to the other. I prefer azimuth, as I'm sure most people do. But um, it's important to be able to, uh, to be able to do the conversions. Um, you guys can pause this slide, pause it right here to practice the, the rest of these, just so you can get a general idea. We're going to be going into the three-point problem now. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go through a step-by-step of the three-point problem. So the, Okay, so I, I, I just made this out of the blue, this problem. Uh, we have a 900 foot elevation, we have 300 foot, and we have 600 foot. Three different points, different elevations. Step one is you connect the points of highest, which is 900, and lowest, which is 300. You connect using just a regular line. Um, you typically want to have a scale and a protractor for this. And then you draw a line perpendicular to the first line um, from the lowest elevation. Um, and then step three, you connect this line, which actually on step two, you measure um, basically the difference between uh, the highest and lowest, which is 600 feet. You measure that out using our scale right here, which I just copied and pasted. In this but uh you use a scale to create 600 foot and then you connect from that point up to 900 foot so you can create a right triangle and then from the lowest elevation you measure the distance equal to the difference in high and intermediate elevations which is 300 foot draw a perpendicular line that intersects the hypotenuse so right here at 300 foot from the lowest elevation that's your uh, your line that intersects the hypotenuse, and then 
you draw a line from that point to the other side, um, you draw a perpendicular line back to the original line, and then that is your structure contour. And you repeat that every thousand foot. And then to figure out the depth, you create a, uh, a triangle on one of these lines. Um, similar to how you created it before, you just create a, a right triangle and then you measure the angle right here. And that'll give you your depth and this is approximately 30, 30 degree depth. Um, yeah, pretty simple. Oh, and then down here is the striking depth that I got, azimuth and quadrant notation. So what we'll do is we'll do a quick three-point problem. 7440, 7480, and we'll do 7480. Copy that. Let's see. This looks like 7880, 7880, okay. And what is the elevation of this one? It kind of looks like it's 8,000. And we'll just go with 8,000. So the first thing you do is draw a line from the highest to the lowest elevation, right there. And then you subtract that, which is 8,000 minus 7,480, plus 20. Uh, we don't have a scale, so I'm just going to eye it, but you use your scale that is on this map. I got this map from the USGS. I think one inch equals uh, a mile or something like that. But we'll just eye it. So, insert. Let's just say this. And it has to be a right line, right angle. Let's just say that's 520 feet because that's the difference between the high and low elevations. And then connect, create a triangle. Okay. Okay, and then you measure off from the lowest point the difference between 8,000, and that looks like 120, but let's double check. 7880, 120. So you measure off 120. That's 120. I don't want to pull out the scale and all that, but just to give you guys an idea of how to do this puzzle. Um, and then you draw a perpendicular line. So, and it wouldn't be straight directly like that. It would be something like that. This looks like it's my structure contour. So we would let me copy over a compass. Okay, so we have our compass, and it appears that the strike is going to be let's see, about 78 degrees or north 78 east strike, and then. I'm not going to get into calculating the dip. Okay, no, I can't really. Oh. Okay. And then basically what you do to create, to get the dip, is to create another triangle at one of the other structure contours that you create. And you just take the angle of that triangle that you create, and that's your dip. So the dip is pretty simple. And that's how we do a three-point problem. So like I said, it's unethical for me to take exactly, you know, directly from this book, these questions. 
from these quizzes because the people from Reg Review put a lot of work into these. I don't want to basically be giving their material out, but I did use uh, give you the basic idea so you could at home uh, figure out how to do these problems. Uh, okay, so question 71, and this is an economic geology uh, question. All you do for, to find the specific gravity of a rock that contains these minerals with these specific gravities at these percentages of each mineral is you multiply 33% uh, which is 0.33 by the specific gravity of pyrite and then you add it to the multiplication between these two, add it to the multiplication of these two, add it to the multiplication of these two and it becomes these basically percentages of each and then you add them together and you get the specific gravity of the rock um, and I, I have the solution right here pretty simple 72 what is the weight percent of pyrite in this rock and basically you take the uh, you, you get your specific gravity for pyrite and divide it by the total specific gravity of the rock and it gives you 46 percent pretty simple uh, and then 73 that was covering metamorphic facies so I would recommend that you guys study uh, kyanite well, the aluminosilicate um, minerals uh, that, that are indicative of certain facies based on temperature and pressure uh, silimonite is going to be more granulite but you can also find in the contact metamorphic, uh, but typically the andalusite is more indicative of contact metamorphism. And then your green schist that is in the question is right here. So that's smack dab between basically kyanite and metamorphic facies. And granulite minerals include pyroxene, plagioclase, garnet, amphiboles. Blue schist minerals contain. Uh, Indicative minerals are glaucophane, lawsonite, uh, chloride, albite, epidote. Conda contact metamorphic minerals include andalusite, silimonite, uh, potassium feldspar, pyroxene, and hornfelds. So I recommend that you guys study the aluminosilicates and the metamorphic facies. Um, it's pretty simple, honestly. And then question 74 is just basically covering Bones reaction series. Um, as a magma cool, you'll have all of the cross crystallize out first, and then quartz will crystallize last. And in terms of being exposed at the surface, it inverses, where quartz is the most resistant resistant to weathering, and olivine will be the most uh, the least resistant. It'll erode the quickest at the surface, which is why it's hard to find olivine at the surface. So question 93 and 94, so this is when the that chemi chemistry math that we took in our undergrad uh, pays off. Um, so we have a, and I, this is based off of the question in the book, we have a 6,000 pound ore waste body and it contains 35% pyrite, 40% galena, and 25% calcasite. Um, it's not any specific rock, it's just minerals that I quickly found and threw them in there. So the question 93 is what is the total weight of the copper? So the atomic weight of copper is 29 grams per mole and the atomic weight of sulfur is 32 grams per mole. So you find a basically a weight percent, um, 29 times 2, which is copper is present in calcasite. You just multiply that by 2, you get 58, and then the total weight of the mineral that you count this height, you just add those two together, you get 90. So 58 divided by 90, you get 64% uh, copper, and then you multiply that by 6,000 pounds of ore, and you get 960 pounds of copper. You can apply the same thing to the question in this book, and you'll be able to determine the answer. And then question 94 is, what is the in-place value of this copper? So basically you take that answer that we got in the last question and just multiply it by, and this isn't 
a true number, but I multiplied it by $2.35 per pound, and I got $2,256. You can apply the same thing to the question asked in the book. Um, the question asked in the book is a little more complicated. Uh, it, there's a lot more minerals that you have to determine, but you basically just find the percent of uh, lead um, in each mineral that's present, or whatever element it was that it's asking, and you just add them all together, and you'll you'll get your total, and it'll it's not too bad. But this is where that chemistry. I also had another uh, request in my last video which was actually a very successful video. So thank you guys for watching, I appreciate it. Um, the, a gentleman named Ryan, I believe, he asked for uh, me to go over hazards. I took a whole class over hazards, so I could potentially do a whole series based on hazards, but I would need something specific to do it in a timely manner. So if you guys have any questions, any concepts you want to go over, just let me know in the comment section below. Thank you.